I have a dream. I've had this dream for a long time. The dream is to take the train up to New York City, uh, eat a corned beef sandwich at Carnegie Deli, uh, the world's best deli, and take the train back to D.C. on the same day just to prove how much I love their sandwiches. So one year ago, Laura surprised me on sabbatical. She got train tickets. We were going to day trip to Carnegie Deli. Now, we also planned a visit to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I had just read a book by the curator, but let's just keep things real. It was not about the museum. It was about the sandwich. So I'm salivating. By the time we get to Penn Station, uh, we walk the 20 blocks up to Carnegie Deli, and it's closed. <laughs> Now, my shirt says it's been open since 1937. <laughs> the day before our trip, the day before, Carnegie Deli closed. Something about a gas line coming into the restaurant. And my dream died at the corner of 7th Avenue and 55th Street in New York City. So this week, our team made a trip back up to New York City with our campus pastors uh, to the Hillsong Conference, but it was not about the conference. <laughs> uh, Carnegie Deli reopened its doors recently, and uh, it was about the sandwich. I love our campus pastors that much. I wanted to take them to Carnegie Deli. Now, I didn't get one sandwich. I got two to make up for the one that I didn't get <laughs> Last year, I think we have a couple of pictures. Uh, first one, Carnegie Deli right outside. It's a beautiful awning. Uh, you see it from a distance. Um, it's pretty incredible. So Carnegie Deli. And, uh, and then uh, I walked over to Central Park because that's a cool place to eat your sandwich. I think we have a shot of me eating one of their world-famous sam uh, famous sandwiches. I think Pastor Rob maybe is in the backdrop, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right, right there. Um, was that a close-up enough picture for you? Uh, and then finally, I mean, this is the real dream that someday, someday, my picture might be framed and hang on the wall. I have no idea how this could happen, but for that picture to hang on the wall at Carnegie Deli would be a dream uh, come true. Made two discoveries on this trip. The first is that uh, as much as I love corned beef, they have a sandwich that's better than corned beef. It's a pastrami corned beef combo. It's called the Woody Allen, and you're going to want to remember that, and you're going to thank me. And the other discovery, um, and I wouldn't be a good passer if I withheld this kind of information. I discovered that they deliver to D.C., yeah, I think we have a little video. Let me just show you what the manager told me. I want you to know that you don't have to leave D.C. You can call up and we will ship it to you overnight. What? Oh. I'm talking about the pastrami, the desserts, whatever it is that we make, you can call the 201 number Come in on. Jersey and he will ship it directly to you Come overnight. On. Do you, come on. No, no, no. Bring it in. Yeah. 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 Did I tell you? I love no it. more treat. Whenever you get the hankers for it, here's the phone you call and stand the next on. day. Done. Overnight shipping. Done. Cool. Is love that it. cool? Made my day. There we go. Now let me make my point. I love New York City. I love the skyline, love Broadway, love Carnegie. Uh, love the Brooklyn Bridge. I actually got up early and did a little bike ride with Pastor Dave, Pastor Mike, uh, to watch the sunrise from the Brooklyn Bridge. Pretty awesome. Uh, I love the above ground city. Uh, but I'm equally amazed by the city beneath the city. You, you know what I'm talking about. There's 722 miles of subway tracks, 4.3 million people walk through the turnstile. I mean, there is like this beehive underneath the city of activity. But did you know there are 9,000 manhole covers, 9,000, and uh, those manhole covers service a 98,000-mile labyrinth of utility cables. That's enough cable to circle the earth four times. We're talking phone lines, uh, gas lines, electric lines, uh, fiber optic. Without those utilities, there's no power, right? There's no lights. Uh, there's no heat. There's no AC. There's no charging your battery. There's nothing. Those utility cables are absolutely critical, especially the one gas line that goes into Carnegie Deli. Uh, here's my point. Your life has an above-ground skyline. It's what people see. Uh, 
They see your job. They see your marriage from the outside. Uh, they see your family. If you're transparent, they may see some scars or maybe some tears, but uh, that's just the skyline. The reality is, is that there are 98,000 miles of utility cables beneath the surface, hidden beneath your marriage, beneath your job, beneath your family, there are expectations. Behind your emotions, behind your opinions, there are expectations. Those expectations are the utility cables that power the whole thing. Every day, 60,000 conscious thoughts fire across your synapses. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, sometimes even God thoughts. Uh, and then there are subconscious desires and disappointments uh, that, that lurk beneath the surface, those hopes and dreams and fears that even are tough to put into words or to verbalize. But it's the expectations, good or bad, high or low, true or false, positive or negative, it's the expectations that light us up, power us up, heat us up, charge us up, cool us off. For better or for worse, those expectations will determine your future more than any other factor. They're the self-talk that determine your mental health. They're the self-fulfilling prophecies that determine who you become. So those expectations better be sanctified by the Spirit of God. They better be in alignment with the Word of God. When Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, part of what it's talking about is renewing those expectations by the promises of God. So our expectations are sanctified by the truth of God, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the promises of God of God. We talk about managing our time and our money, right? And those things are important, but not as important as managing your expectations. So we talked about going from fear to faith, from comparison to confidence, from independence to reliance, from shame to significance. This weekend, we're going to talk for a few minutes about going from doubt to expectation. Now, here's the deal. Expectations are everywhere. Uh, they're underneath every manhole cover. They power every part of your personality. And uh, just because there were the opening ceremonies this week, let me just use the, ex the Olympics as an example. Uh, fascinating study done with Olympic athletes uh, led by Vicki Medvek. Studied medalists and uh, discovered that bronze medalists were quantifiably happier than silver medalists. Which makes no sense at all because the silver medalist beat the bronze medalist. So what, what's going on? Well, here's, here's what the research discovered. Silver medalists tended to focus on how close they came to winning a gold medal, and so they weren't satisfied with silver. Bronze medalists were focused on how close they came to not getting a medal at all. <laughs> and so they're thrilled with the bronze medal. They're happy to be on the metal stand at all. Your focus determines your reality. It is not your objective circumstances. It is your subjective expectations that determine how you feel, how you think, how you make decisions, how you live your life. Okay, this is not a message on marriage. But I'll tell you this, many marriages struggle because of false expectations, unrealistic expectations, expectations that are too high or too low, a mismanagement of expectation. Man, can make marriage a pretty tough thing. A healthy marriage is about managing your expectations. And you know what I find? Sometimes it takes a little bit of counseling to help you identify what your expectations are so that you don't sabotage that relationship. Let me share one more study, and then we'll dive into Scripture. I love our teachers at NCC, a uh, lot of teachers. And uh, teachers, you know what I'm about to tell you, and so this is for everybody else. Um, you know that your expectations have a lot to do with how your students perform. Uh, hundreds of studies have quantified this in a variety of ways, but here's one. Several years ago, a school district in San Francisco did an experiment, chose three teachers, and told them, you're the best we have. We want you to teach 90 high IQ students. We're going to let you move at their pace and see how much you can learn 
in a year. By the end of the year, those specially selected students achieved 30% more. They did 30% better than the rest of the school district. And so at the end of the year, the principal called the three teachers into his office and said, I have a confession to make. Uh, you didn't have 90 high IQ students. They were run-of-the-mill students, randomly selected. Teachers feeling pretty good about themselves right there until the principal said, I have another confession. You're not the best teachers we have. <laughs> Your names were the first three names out of the hat. The researchers who did this study concluded that the extraordinary achievement could only be attributed to one thing, high expectations. And they, they came to this conclusion. Expectation is more important than IQ. Oh, come on. This is significant. This is huge. This, this has some bearing uh, on your family, the way that you parent. What kind of expectations are we creating for our children? Uh, huge implications in the workplace. Listen, go ahead and, and manage inventory, but you better manage expectations of the people that you're working with. Because at the end of the day, uh, that's the name of the game. And it has huge implications spiritually. You know, I think it was Henry Ford who said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. But this is not uh, some weekend where we talk about expectations and just kind of Jedi mind trick it, right? Or, you know, Stuart Smalley, Jack Handy, deep thoughts, whatever, you're good enough, smart enough, doggone it, people like you. No, Th this is about, let me define faith for you. Faith is aligning your life with the promises of God so that your expectations are sanctified. It's living out of a sanctified expectation of what is God going to do next, where the miracle isn't the anomaly, where you're waiting for God to show up and show off because you know that's who he is and what he does. Well, that is a backdrop. Let's look at Acts chapter 27. But I'm going to bookend it first, and we'll put these verses uh, on the screen. First bookend is uh, Acts 19.21. Paul, simple statement. I must visit Rome. That's the goal. That's the plan. That's the destination. You might say that's the expectation. So Paul, Roman citizen, and, and not unlike uh, a lot of people who want to make a pilgr pilgrimage to Washington, D.C., do their patriotic duty, right? Um, come to D.C. I think Paul had a desire to go and see his capital city. Uh, and so um, he also wanted to preach the gospel in Rome. So Paul says, I must visit Rome. Now fast forward nine chapters, and, and here's the other bookend, uh, Acts 28, 14. And so we came to Rome. I mean, it's just such a simple, easy landing, right? Just bam. We're here. Um, you know, it only takes a few minutes to read from Acts 19 to Acts 28. I mean, it's, it's incredibly easy uh, how easy Paul got there. Um, right? Goal accomplished. Expectations met. Dream becomes reality. Everything goes according to plan. Uh, not exactly. Uh, next to nothing went according to plan. Paul got to Rome, but not how or when or where um, he expected now, we don't have time to look at all the intervening chapters, but there's a citywide riot, uh, an assassination plot, and a trial on par with the OJ trial. Just kind of right in those chapters. Uh, and so when Paul says, I must visit Rome, he's thinking cruise ship, welcoming committee, red carpet, maybe ticker tape parade. Uh, but that isn't how it happens. Paul is arrested, put in chains, and then he's put on a prisoner transport ship. This is not how Paul wants to get to Rome. The plan is out the window. It goes from bad to worse. He's on the prisoner transport ship, and there's a storm at sea. So bad they throw ropes around the hull of the ship to keep it from breaking up. Uh, so bad that they throw all of their cargo overboard, and that's where we pick up the story in Acts 27 27. Why don't you go ahead and stand at all of our campuses? Go ahead and stand. And uh, as we read God's word, Acts chapter 27, verse 27. Uh, on the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. Uh, they took soundings 
and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped not one, not two, not three, but yeah, four anchors. Say four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Turn to your neighbor and say, prayed for daylight. You know what? Sometimes you need to drop anchor and pray for daylight. I want to share a message titled, Four Anchors. You can grab your seat. Now, let me say this up front. I have a boater's license, and I got it after failing the exam several times. Uh, I am not seaworthy. A little out of my depth right here, but I do know this. Uh, If you got an anchor, if you're going to anchor a boat, you better make sure that the rope or anchor on that boat is long enough so that the anchor hits bottom. If it didn't hit bottom, it's no good. So the anchor has to go deep enough. And I know this, uh, you better make sure that your anchor is heavy enough. Big boat, big anchor, okay? Small boat, maybe you can get by with a small anchor, but it better be big enough for the boat. Queen Mary has an anchor chain that stretches 990 feet and weighs 45 tons. Yeah. Now you also need to make sure you have the right kind of anchor. They're mushroom anchors uh, that work well with small boats and soft bottoms. And then there's another kind of anchor. There's the Danforth anchor. And uh, it looks a little something like, like this. Now the beautiful thing about this is that uh, When it hits bottom, the flukes dig into that bottom and the anchor, in a sense, buries itself in the bottom and it keeps the ship from drifting. Now, it's going to get heavy, so I'm going to put it back down. Uh, I want to talk about four anchors this weekend. And uh, here's the bottom line. When you hit a storm, and we all do, When you hit rock bottom, what do you anchor to? What's your anchor? Uh, Because if you don't have an anchor, you're going to go here and there. You're going to go wherever the current takes you. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. We better make sure that we have some anchors to drop. Uh, some expectation anchors, if you will. And so I want to share four of my anchors, and you're going to get an assignment at the end of this um, to, to determine your four anchors. I mean, you can steal one or two or four of mine if you want. But, but here's the bottom line. I've learned that the promises of God are what I'm going to anchor to. Those are the anchors that I'm going to drop and make sure that those promises hold me steadfast in the middle of God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. So let me share my four anchors. Truth is, I have a lot more than this, but here are four. Isaiah 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, declares the Lord. If you've been around NCC for any length of time, uh, you know that this is my theological ground zero. This is my starting point. Uh, God likens the difference between our thoughts and his thoughts, our ways and his ways, to the expanse of space, to essentially uh, the distance from one end of the universe uh, to the other. Now, now here's the deal. Uh, Astrophysicists have discovered galaxies 15.5 billion light years away. I'm going to give you the short version. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So, you know, one minute later, it's 11 million miles away. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? And so our sun, 93 million miles away, just over eight minutes that the sun leaves the surface and hits us, right? And so light is, is the fa- it's a speed limit. It's the fastest thing there is. Um, a, a light year is the equivalent of 5.88 trillion miles. Now, if you multiply that by 15.5 billion light years, um, good luck. <laughs> if you can do that, I, I really want to see that number. Um, th- that is, is an inestimable amount of zeros. It, it's, it, it's a quantity, it's an expanse that's just impossible for us. And God says, now that's about the distance between my thoughts and your thoughts. So here's my thought. Your best thought on your best day is 15.5 billion light years short of how great and how good God really is. I tell you this, everybody at all eight of our campuses, you walked in the door this weekend underestimating how great and how good God is. 
by at least 15.5 billion light years. That's my starting place. What does that do for your expectations? Come on, then your expectations are off the chart because you know that his ways are higher. You know that his thoughts are higher. Man, and that's just the first anchor. But every once in a while, I need to drop that anchor and remind myself his ways are higher than my ways. Here's my second anchor. Uh, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, it doesn't say all things are good. Uh, why? Because we live in a fallen world. Bad things happen to good people. Uh, listen, there's a war raging between good and evil. Turn on the news. Watch it for two minutes. We're in the middle of it. And uh, we're not immune. We're not exempt. Now, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. But the reality is we're surrounded by a fallen world. Um, life isn't fair. Bad things happen. But here's what I believe. We, we have a hope. We have a sanctified expectation that God can recycle any mistake with his grace. That God can redeem any situation with his love and with his power. And it may not be good, but it can eventually bring glory to God. And God can even flip it and make it work out for good. You can even be a better person, a stronger person because of the things that happen in your life. And so I find myself all the time, I, I, this isn't fair, don't like this situation. Better drop a Romans 8.28 anchor. Somehow, God, you're going to work this together for my good. Third anchor is Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, 1,741 ifs in the Bible, most of them at the front of God's conditional promises. If you do this, God's gonna deliver on it, right? Love all of those promises, but my favorite promise is uh, 831. If God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, even if it seems like the odds are stacked against you, no, 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 no. The odds are stacked in your favor. God plus one is a majority. Uh, God is for you every day in every way. And that anchors my expectations. See, all I need to know is that God is with me and God is for me. And so I drop that anchor. I know that no weapon formed against me will stand. I know that he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. So when I hit that storm, uh, when, I, when I hit that moment where I feel like I'm gonna crash and burn, Man, I drop that Romans 8.31 anchor. Let me give you one more anchor. Uh, Ephesians 3.20, not to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all I can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within me. To him be glory in the church and throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That gets me fired up. Let me tell you a testimony. I'm going to tell you another testimony in a few weeks. Unbelievable miracles happened during this series in my life. I'm not even going to tell you about that one. I'm going to tell you about another one. When I was in the eighth grade, uh, I was hospitalized uh, two weeks in the hospital because of asthma. And uh, I remember it because it was the, uh, man, it was, it was the uh, 84 Olympics in L.A. You remember this? And uh, I was in junior high. And, um, and I remember I missed, I missed football tryouts. And it was devastating. And uh, it was just a cut, tough couple of weeks and afterwards finally came home and a prayer team from our church came over and, and said they wanted to pray for me. And Pastor Paul McGarvey, who one day I would end up doing an internship with uh, to prepare for ministry, said, what can we pray for? And we said, would you pray that God would heal my asthma? And I remember we, we joined our faith, we joined hands, they laid hands on me, they prayed for me, they prayed that God would heal my asthma. Now here's the deal, I woke up the next morning and I still had asthma but every wart on my feet was gone. <laughs> my warts were gone. Um, kid you not. Now, at first, that was a little confusing. Thought, like, is this like a game of telephone? Like, so, somewhere, someone somewhere else is breathing great, but still has warts on their feet, right? <laughs> um, like, this makes no sense. And, and, but in that moment, I, I would describe that as maybe one of the very first times that I heard the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I felt like the still small voice of the Holy Spirit said, Mark, I just want you to know that I'm able. Bam, and that moment has anchored me since the eighth 
grade. Listen, I don't always get what I ask for. I usually don't because I probably pray for the wrong stuff. But when God does a miracle in your life, you've got to anchor to that miracle. You've got to remind yourself of the miracles that God has done. So many times I go back to that moment and say, God, I don't know your will or your way, your will and your way is 15.5 billion light years beyond what I can understand. But I know you're able. I know you're able. In fact, I know that you're able to do immeasurably more than all I can ask or imagine. And so I drop anchor right there. Revelation 12, 11 says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Your testimony is a powerful thing. We're talking about expectations. Can't talk about expectations without talking about testimony. A testimony doesn't just remind us of what God did back here. A testimony is a statement of faith that the God who did it before can do it again. That the God who did this can do that. And it actually anchors us to a future hope that God has given us. In fact, Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you are testifying, you are prophesying about what God is gonna do again, what God wants to do next. Uh, sharing a testimony, it sanctifies our expectations. In fact, I think it's loaning your faith to someone else. And then when you hear a testimony, you're borrowing faith from someone else. And somehow, some way, Saint, uh, expectations are sanctified. Here's what I think. I think a lot of churches don't share testimonies. And then they wonder why there aren't miracles, why there isn't anyone getting healed, why there isn't deliverance. I'll tell you why, because there's zero expectation. Show me a church where there's no supernatural things happening, and I'll show you a church where there aren't testimonies being shared. It's hard to argue with the testimony. Something powerful happens when we begin to share our testimony. It begins to align our expectations with the God who is able. Verse 33. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. Now hold on right here. Because if ever there was an unrealistic expectation, if ever there was a crazy expectation, it's, it's they're at sea for 14 days, tossed by the storm, and Paul said, you're gonna be fine. You know, here, here's the thing though. Paul ain't the captain. He's the prisoner. Aye, aye, prisoner. Like, what does Paul know? Paul's not a sailor. Where is this coming from? What, what gives him the courage to say not one of the 276 soldiers and sailors and prisoners on board will perish? Not a single hair of your head will be harmed. What gave him that kind of expectation? Well, I'll tell you, he had a vision. He had a vision from God. Now the circumstances were arguing otherwise, that this does not look good, but he had a vision from God and, and that vision sanctified his expectation. When you get a word from God, a promise from God, a vision from God, that's your sanctified expectation. You better white knuckle, you better vice grip that expectation. You better drop those anchors and stand your holy ground. When the storm rages, rages, it's the person with sanctified expectation who stands up and rebukes the wind and the waves and says, peace be still. When you're about to hit rock bottom, it's the person with sanctified expectation that stands up and makes a bold proclamation based on the promises 
of God. Paul is that person. A sanctified expectation. What a moment. It's a game changer and it changes the course of history. Here's the deal. I don't have time to even end this story. Um, That's all we have time for. I mean, it gets even better. So it does, there is a shipwreck. Oh, and then they land on the island of Malta. Oh, and then Paul's gathering wood. Oh, and then he's bit by a poisonous snake. I know you've had bad days. Have you ever had a shipwreck and a snake bite in the same day? Quit complaining, right? I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, this is unbelievable. But Paul uh, is healed miraculously. The same God who delivers him from the shipwreck is the same God who heals him of the snake bite, ends up in an island-wide revival, which may be the whole reason for the storm to begin with. They get back on the ship, and then we land at Acts 28, 14, and so they came to Rome. (laughs) We're here. Bam, right? I must visit Rome. So we came to Rome. Let me ask you a question. What's your Rome? What's your Rome? What's your goal? What's your destination? What's your dream? What's your expectation? See, here's what we want. We want to put it in GPS, and then we want the shortest route without traffic, right? Fast pass. We want a fast pass, and we want to get right there as quickly as possible. But it usually doesn't work that way. What's your Rome? What's your Rome? Now, it might be, I don't know, maybe it's getting married. Maybe it's having kids, starting a family. Maybe it's paying off a school loan, buying a home. Uh, it takes a miracle here in D.C. Uh, might be a promotion at work, an entrepreneurial idea, something that, man, that's Rome. I must visit Rome. You want Rome. Uh, you have a destination in mind, a relational, financial, occupational expectation. Here's what I can almost guarantee. You won't get there when or where or how you expect. Some crazy stuff is going to happen between here and there. And that's when you grab the anchors, right? No, 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 no. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than my ways. I trust you. All things work together for good. To them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And you just, you drop the anchor. If God is for us, who can be against us? Come on, bring it on. Bring it on. Not to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. To him be glory in the church and throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And we drop anchor. Why why do we do that benediction at the end of most of our services? Because you know what? Tomorrow's Monday, right? The next day is Monday, right? And I know that on Monday, bam, you better have your anchor down. Because some storms are going to hit. Got to anchor it. I don't even know where I was. <laughs> but here's what I know. Here's what I know. God wants you to get where God wants you to go more than you want to get where you want to go. And he's good at getting us there. It's going to be some crazy or some crazy stuff happening. But I've learned that sometimes it takes a shipwreck to get where God wants you to go. I wish I didn't have to say that. It's not what I wanted to say at 22 years of age, trying to plant a church in Chicago. Had a vision, had a dream, had a 25-year plan. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. (laughs) That church plant crashed and burned. It was a shipwreck. But God used that shipwreck to get us right where he wanted us to go from the very beginning. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for a shipwreck. And so I'm so grateful. It shook my faith a little. It did. But you know what? I've learned over the years to drop anchor on the promises of God and live my life accordingly. Paul had an itinerary, had a timeline, had places to go, things to do. Funny thing is, Rome wasn't even the destination. Spain was. 
He wanted to go to Spain. He thought Rome would be a stopover. Love what Charles Allen says, to go to Spain was his dream and his plan. We dream of conquest in Spain, but many end up in some prison house of life, chained, confined, and disappointed. But you know what I love about Paul? Under house arrest for two years in Rome. But let me ask you a question. How else are you gonna get a guy with ADHD to sit still long enough to write Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians? Shipwreck, snake bite, imprisonment. But without that imprisonment, I don't even know if I have one of my anchors. Not a him who was able to do a measure, Ephesians 3.20. Oh, and by the way, all things work together for good. I don't know what your Rome is, but I know that God wants to get you where God wants you to go more than you want to get where God wants you to go. So drop anchor. Pray for daylight. Let me close with this. I want to invite our worship teams at our campuses to just prepare to come as we prepare to take communion. I'm going to share one last thought. We're going to put this verse on the screen. I want it to be our focal point here, last two minutes. It says in Hebrews 6, 19, we have this hope, sanctified expectation. We have this hope as an anchor, an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. This is a unique anchor in the book of Hebrews. In the world of sailing, there's something called kedging. I'm just wondering who even knows what kedging is. Anybody familiar with that term? In the 1904 Royal Navy Seamanship Manual, it describes kedging as maneuvering large ships in and out of tight harbors. Sailors would get in rowboats and they would go out in front of the ship and they would take the anchor with them. And they would put, based on their soundings of knowing where they might run aground, they would put the anchor exactly where they wanted to go. And then they would pull themselves. It's hard labor. It was a slow process, but they would pull themselves toward that anchor. It's the only way to navigate difficult waters, dangerous waters. Waters, expectations, sanctified expectations, faith is throwing our anchor ahead of us and anchoring to the promises of God and then pulling our way toward them. It's anchoring to the cross of Christ. It's anchoring to an empty tune. It's, it's anchoring to the throne of God. And we pull ourselves towards it. Powerful imagery here in Hebrews 6. Where do we throw our anchor? It says, we throw our anchor behind the inner curtain into the inner sanctuary. What is happening here? What a weird mixed metaphor. But stick with me for 30 seconds and there's a payoff. Communion's gonna be different this weekend than it's been before for you. Uh, the inner sanctuary was the holy of holies, the most holy place. In Judaism, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies and only he could do it one day a year on the Day of Atonement. It was the one day where he would go in and atonement, a covering, would cover the nation of Israel for another year. It was this moment of forgiveness, this moment of atonement. We have a high priest, Hebrews says, that went into the Holy of Holies and made a sacrifice once and for all. In fact, the Bible says that when he hung on that cross, that the curtain tore in two from top to bottom as that anchor went into the Holy of Holies. Here's the deal. Jesus entered the Holy of Holies for us. He won atonement for us on the cross. The anchor's already there. And by faith, all we have to do is pull ourselves in where Christ has already anchored it into the Holy of Holies. Listen, if you are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, ah, oh, I so desperately want you to experience that. There's nothing like it. It's joy unspeakable. There's no words for it. You gotta anchor yourself to something to someone, I'm gonna anchor myself to the one who went to a cross. You mean the cross 
to Christ. He loves you that much. I'm going to anchor myself to the one who went to a cross for me. I want to challenge you to do that. And this weekend, whatever mountain needs to move, forgiveness, healing, deliverance, each of them was purchased at the cross. It was paid in full. He said, it is finished. The anchor's there. Let's pull ourselves into it. Let's pray. Father, help us as we celebrate these sacred moments and take communion together to consecrate this moment. Lord, those who are in a place of doubt, may you take them to a place of sanctified expectation. May they drop anchor, not one, not two, not three, but four anchors this weekend into the truth of God, the word of God, the promises of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.